All right, let's get started. So, um, um, today uh, we begin probably one of the, I don't say the, the, the most, it's not the hardest topic in the class, I'd say it's probably the one that will put the most miles on your manual. Uh, topic in this course, and that's the strictly brake speed design. Because there are a lot of instances where you're going to have to turn back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So if there's any one topic where the tabs in your manual uh, are going to come in handy, it's going to be this one. All right. Um, let's talk about scheduling. So I don't have it on the slide, but or start scheduling about uh, term logistics. I don't have it on the slide, but homework number six was graded. Um, I think I have it on the card outside my office. If not, it's going on the card outside my office as soon as I get out of here. Um, for the most part, I think everybody did pretty well. There was a couple nitpicky things on the, the problem. If, our, if you recall, there was a problem where you had to graph this in Excel. There was a couple little nitpicky things on that. But by and large, uh, you all did pretty well on that. So homework one, two, three, four, five, and six are graded. Homework number seven, the TA is still working on it, um, but other than that, all the outstanding assignments in here are, are graded, um, and you all turned in homework number eight today. So what I'm going to do is because I got a lot of folks up here, I'm going to take these assignments and stick them on the chair. Uh, I know that there was a wastewater treatment plant tour today, so there's some folks that are going to be meandering their way in, just be, uh, you know, don't, don't make a bunch of noise, um, but go ahead and turn your homeworks in on that chair if you have not already done so. Um, we have a homework assignment, and so let me make, explain scheduling for the rest of the semester. We are, we're, we're winding it down. Um, we are here today, and we're going to talk about discreetly brace beam design. We are going to continue talking about this final topic uh, and shear and uh, the super tables. Once we're done, we're done. We're not going to meet again until May the 3rd. So there's a good chance that at least Wednesday of next week we won't have class. There is also a good chance that maybe even Monday of next week we won't have class. I don't know. I'm not promising you anything. But I'm telling you that we're going to talk until we're done, and then once we're done with the, the topics of the course, we won't meet again until May the 3rd. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? Final point of logistics, the course evals. I've seen that there's, uh, so what I can do is, the only thing that I know is how many people have completed it, and I checked it right before class, and I saw 21 people had done the course eval, which is great. I really do want your feedback. I'm planning on doing a good bit of overhaul this summer uh, on a lot of my classes, and I'd really like the feedback. But only 19 of you have uploaded the little picture that shows me that you've done it to Blackboard. So, again, if you do that, that's free homework points. So, uh, for those two that did the survey but didn't upload to Blackboard, do so, because I don't know who did what. Now, if I get a 100% response rate, I'll know everybody did it. I'll give everybody homework points, but i, I got to know that for you. All right, sound good? Okay. That's all I got. Like I said, um, today is probably the day where, or this topic, where you start putting some miles on that manual. So, and we are going to begin a really, really big example problem, which is probably the biggest example that we've done all semester. Because we're, the way this example is going to work is we're going to have a beam design problem, but we're actually going to do it four times. So it's actually going to be four beam designs. And I'm doing it to give you all some experience with what on the surface looks like a really, really scary design aid. It's not scary, but I want to sort of remove the mystery from it. Okay, so I want to go to this part right here in the slides. Okay, and I'm going to draw something up here on the board. So we have zone one, zone two, and zone three. But if we want to keep this simple, if we want to keep this straightforward, easy to understand. I'm going to write this like follows. So we have continuously braced beams and we have discreetly braced beams. Now, 
For a continuously braced beam, what can you tell me about the capacity? How do I determine Mn for a continuously braced beam? Now, I hope you can tell me because you just did homework on it. What is the capacity of a continuously braced beam? Well, the .9 is the feed value, so, I mean, there's that. But what is FYCX, just verbally? The plastic moment. So, that's the capacity, right, of a beam that is continuously braced that isn't going to buckle, okay? Well, for a discreetly braced beam, if you want a really, really simple way of writing what the uh, discreetly braced capacity is, what do beams that are discreetly braced want to do? Like behaviorally. When they fail, they're going to fail by doing what? With their twist, they're going to buckle, right? They're going to go on, undergo LTB, lateral torsional buckling. So I propose that the capacity is going to have something to do with whatever the lateral torsional buckling capacity is. But there's a couple things wrong with that. First off, it's not enough by itself because when we derive that, we assume that the capacity, or we assume that the moment is constant. So we adjusted all those capacities by a C sub B quantity, right? Remember that? So here's our equations for zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3. And all these zones related to buckling, we've got this C sub B term in there. Here it's explicitly in the zone 2 expression. And in zone 3, it looks like it's not there, but if you look at the equation for FCR, there it is. So ultimately, we have that. But even this isn't enough. The reason why it's not enough is because if I look at the plot, here's the plot with CB equals 1. Here's the plot with what happens when you introduce a C sub B. And C sub B can serve to increase the moment capacity. But what's the problem with that? We always cut it off at MP. So if you want a simple formula, the capacity is the minimum of whatever this is or that. Would that be a simple way of writing it? Just conceptually. Now, what gets tricky is how do we compute the, the LTB moment? Because there's a lot going on. I mean, here's what the curve looks like. You know, we've got LB, we've got MN, we've got zone 1, zone 2, we've got zone 3, this is MP, this is MR, this is LP, this is LR, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on uh, with those expressions, right? So if I look at those equations, they get, let me skip ahead a little bit. If I look at those equations, they get pretty nasty pretty quick, right? I mean, just look at the FCR expression. The FCR expression has J's and section moduli and RTS values and, and all bunches of, of, of different variables all over the place, right? Okay, Here, here's the point I'm making. I want to go back to something that we did with columns. See, with columns, we had just one curve, right? On this curve, we had K, on this axis, we had KL over R, and on this axis, we had some buckling stress, and we were able to write a curve that looks something like that. And the nice thing about columns is, granted, while we had two different equations, we had an inelastic equation, we had an elastic equation, what was nice about columns was that we could use one equation, and that one curve would work for any column in the manual. In other words, the column capacity curve for a W10 by 49 was the exact same column capacity curve for a, a W8 by 31 or a, a, a W whatever. I mean, we could use the same curve for every column. We can't, however, use the same curve for every beam. See, this curve is dependent on a bunch of different parameters for each beam. So like FCR, FCR changes if I'm looking at a W14 by 22 versus a W30 by 90, because each of those two shapes have a different SX value, an RTS value, and a J value. So unfortunately, every time we draw this curve, it's always going to change if I look at one shape to another. The, the curve always changes. 
So unfortunately, that creates a little bit of a mess from a design perspective. Okay? We did an example last time where we looked at analysis. Okay? Uh, and overall, is everybody okay with that example? Did anybody have any questions about how we you know, calculated FCR, how we looked at BF values or LP and LR? Was, that, was all that stuff pretty straightforward? Okay. Well, here, here's the thing. To design a beam that's discreetly braced, we need this. We need this curve uh, because that curve tells us the capacity of the beam based off LTB. And it's difficult because every beam has its own curve. So the way that the manual handles that, you're going to laugh, but it does this. It basically plotted every damn LTB curve on top of one another. Okay? This is on table, this is table 3-10. I put on the announcement slide, it's 3-11, that's my fault, apologies. This is table 3-10. It starts on page 3-99. Uh, if you have your manual, you should, I mean, you definitely need to have your manual. And, and I'm going to tell you, look, you really need to bring it, like, for the next few days, because understanding how this, this uh, uh, design aid works, it's not hard, but it would really help if you had it with you. I'm just telling you. Um, okay, now, first off, this may look like a mess, and it is. Um, basically, all this is, is that curve plotted to scale for every beam in the main. Okay? Now, there's a couple things that I want you to sort of pay attention to. Um, first off. Um, if you look over on the y-axis, okay, on the y-axis, you will see that there are two, actually two different scales. Keep in mind that you're always going to be using the blue numbers, not the green numbers. But um, that's the first thing I'd like you to pay attention to. The next thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the lines themselves. Okay. Anybody, what's going on between the two curves? Like, does anybody see a difference between the way the lines are plotted? Like, some of them look solid, and some of them look dashed, right? Does everybody see that? Why do you think that is? I'm asking, I'm curious. Why are some of these lines solid and some of them dashed? Say again? Not quite, but you're right on the money in terms of uh, the concept. Okay? Within a given region, the solid lines are the ones that are most economical. Okay? If you go back to the ZX table, remember how you'd solve for ZX, but then you wouldn't pick the, the, the shape that had that near ZX value. You'd always go up a few rows until you found that first bolded row. Because that first bolded row was the lightest shape within that given region, right? Well, it's the same thing here. So what you're going to do is you're going to find a point and then go to the next solid line. I'm going to show you how that works here in a second. Um, that's the first point I, I want you to, 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 to recognize. So right here, so again, the solid lines refer to the most economical sections. So you're always going to want to pick a solid curve. However, there's another thing I want you to point out. What is the FY value for these curves? 50 KSI. So right off the bat, these curves are only valid if FY is 50. And if FY is not 50, these curves are completely invalid. Okay? So just to be clear, now 50 KSI is the most common yield stress for a W shape. This is highly you know, a, a reasonable curve, but just something to keep in mind. What other value is, sticks out in your head for these curves? What's, what's one value that pops out or should pop out on the page? CB. Oh, what is C sub B? One. One. So these curves have been drawn based off of a C sub B value equals one. Okay? And that's really, really, really important. Yes? Page 3-99. Yes. Technically, these that, start on 3-92. Is, is that a typo? 
And that's in a box, too. <laughs> I didn't know if there was something particular about three ninety nine versus the beginning. Of oh, no, I know why. I know why. I know why. This, that's the one on that page, I think. No, that's all. Or it's not. That, it's a typo. It's a typo. They start on 392. So we're going to go and add like half a mistake to that. We'll add half a mistake. Yes? Um, you said that the solid lines are more economical. When would you ever use a dash line? That's a great question. When would you ever use a dash line? Two reasons. One, if you're in rating mode, you might be evaluating a beam that exists. Like, here's the beam I have, so I'd like to know its capacity. So if you're in... in the, the example that I'm sort of thinking of is if you have a bridge that you're rating and they use the W10 by whatever, well, that's the beam that you have. Um, the second reason as to why you would use a solid line or why you would use a dash line, by and large, I wouldn't unless it was the only thing that was available. So, uh, you know, steel is a product that sometimes has some variable availability, so if all they have is a W33 by 291, if it's affordable, go with it. So, the, I mean, honestly, so that would be my short answer. I feel like that. Yeah, I just, I, yeah. Yeah. Isn't there a chance that like the LTP wouldn't go for the LTP failure, and then you can use that to find something? You're stealing my thunder. I'm getting to that here in a second. I'm, you're, there's, there's a very explicit point I want to make here in a second about how we handle that because I want to go back to something that we looked at on example two, or sorry, example two, uh, the last example that we did from zone two. Sorry about that. We did an example last time where we looked at the capacity of a beam as its unbraced length increased. And so we had an unbraced length of 5 feet, an unbraced length of 15 feet, and an unbraced length of 25 feet. Y'all remember that? What was the capacity for zone 1? Does anybody remember what we got for the last example? Zone 1 was 750 foot kits for zone 1. What do we get for zone 2? 750 foot kits. We got the same thing. Even though Zone two capacity should be lower. Why did we get the same? Why did we get seven fifty? Why? I'm asking. Exactly. C sub B values augmented the capacity, but I don't care what C sub B does. You're limited to MP, right? Okay. Okay. That's a big key point I want to make. Okay. So. Let me explain how this curve works. The table plots the capacity for a C sub B value equals 1. You've got to plot it off something. So all those <coughs> plots that you see there are plotted assuming a C sub B value is 1. Okay? We rarely deal with C sub B values that are equal to 1 in practice. So what we have to do is this. We do our structural analysis and we compute a factored moment. Okay? And what we do is we go into that table with on the x-axis we go on the unbraced length and on the y-axis we go into the table with not the factored moment but the factored moment divided by whatever c sub b is okay so by dividing it we sort of are kind of going into the table with the c sub b value equal to one but there's a very important point to make about that here in a second now, let me explain the mechanics of how the table works so let's say that you do some math and you have an lb value 20 feet, and you do MU over CB, and you get something like 272.5. And I want everybody to do this together, because I really want this to, to be clear as to how we're doing this. Okay? So, what you do is you start turning through uh, on the x-axis, and you find the point on the x-axis where LB is 20 feet, and on the y-axis you find where the moment divided by CB is something like 272.5. So I've got that about right here. So I want you all to start turning through the manual and see where you can find it. I, and don't 
don't worry about the blue shaded region or anything like that right now. I just want you to find that page and that point in these tables. Because these tables cross over, you know, like 10, you know, like 20 pages or whatnot. So I want you to find that point. within a given region. And if you look right here, look at, for instance, the 16 by 67. See how it's solid here, but then it's dashed? Because as you drop down here, the 65 is actually lighter. So it actually just depends on which region you're in. So there's that's a little bit of a better answer. Okay. All right. What I want you to do in your head, once you have <laughs> found that spot, is draw you a little crosshairs, like I have here, these red dashed lines. Okay. Any section that's in that blue region in quadrant one, the upper right-hand quadrant, is a safe section. Okay? Why is quadrant one the section that's safe? Well, anything in quadrant one is going to indicate a section that has a higher moment capacity and a section that has a longer unbraced length. Does that make sense? Because remember, what does unbraced length do? As the unbraced length gets larger, the capacity, how strong the beam is, goes down, right? So anything over here is going to have a longer unbraced length. Longer unbraced length means weak, weak means strong capacity if, if the values are higher. Right. Is everybody okay with that? So what you're going to do, you can draw yourself a little crosshair in your head, and you're going to sort of go up into quadrant one, and you're going to find the first solid line that you can. So for this instance, what shape is that? 14 so 14 by 61. Now, I know you can see that on the slide. I want to see if you can see that in the manual. That's the big thing. I want you to make sure that you can see that. That you can find that point, go up to the right, and find that W14 by 61. Does everybody see that? All right. Is everybody okay with that? Now, the big point, and I can't begin to stress this enough more than anything, is that that W14 by 61 is a trial shape. It is not necessarily the final selection. We pick that shape. We have to check its capacity. We absolutely must check, check its capacity. Remember, we're going into the table with dividing out C sub B. So what might be happening, and we won't know until we do the math, but what might be happening is by dividing by C sub B, we're going into the table and assuming that the W14 by 61's capacity is up here. But that's not the case. The 1461's capacity might be right there, cut off at MP. And it might be that the W14 by 61 is no good. We're not going to be able to know that. We're not going to know that until we check it. Now, let's say that we check the W14 by 61 and it's no good. What do we do? We go to the next shape uh, in this plot. So if the W14 by 61 is no good, we go to the next one, which is what? W12 by 
W12 by 65. And we check in. If it's no good, we just go to the next one. We just keep going up in that region until we find uh, the shape that works. So the shape after that is probably the 16 by 67. Or then the 14 by 68. The 12 by 72. The 18 by 76. We just keep going on until we find the first shape that works. It's very possible that the first shape that we pick is good. It's great. Um, it's very possible, however, that we have to iterate quite a bit. I will go ahead and tell you, the larger your C sub B value, the bigger the chance that you're going to have to iterate. Like if you have a C sub B value that's like 1.1 or 1.2, there's a real good chance that the first section that you pick is going to be good. But if you have a C sub B value that's like 2.1, chances are you're going to have to go through a few to check and see whether or not it's good. Yes? So say that this shape does work. 14 by 61 with the CB being assumed to be B. Do we not have to recalculate C CB or can we just go with those assumptions? No. I think what we do in the, in the next example is going to clarify that. But we're going to take this section and then analyze it like we did in example 23. Determine its capacity and see if phi and is greater than or equal to MU. Does that make sense? We're going to practice it, so don't worry. We're going to do like four different beam designs to make sure that we're comfortable with this. I guess what I'm saying is how, do you, how can you just assume C sub B is 1? We're, we're not. We're, we're, let me be clear. Okay? We're going into the chart dividing C sub B out. But the way that we verify that assumption is checking its capacity. So this isn't the end. Like we don't just pick a section and go home. We have to go check that section. So we, we make the assumption to get a shape, but then we have to verify that assumption. All right. Everybody good? You look like, did you have a question? No. Well, I kind of did, but just for like the intended like purposes of this course, we're not ever going to use a dash line. No, 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 no. What did no. you say exactly the dash line were? They're the sections that are a little bit heavier within a given region. So look right here. Okay, look at this. Okay. If I go up, the first section that I see is like this W21 by 68, but it's a lot lighter than the W14 by 61. In that given region, the W14 by 61 is the lightest. So start there. Let me be clear also about another thing. A solid line on this curve may not be a bolded line in the ZX tape. Okay? Again, it's all about what's the most economical section within a given region. Within this region right here, the 16 by 67 is a potential option. But down here, it's not because it's dashed. It's just all about what's the most economical section uh, within a given region. Does that make sense? Yes. So if it changes to dash before your horizontal line, then it's out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That shouldn't happen within quadrant one. I guess it's possible that it could, but it usually doesn't. So, does that make sense? I wish I had a better answer for that, but it's really just a region by region plot, and so it just depends. So, I don't really, there, there really isn't a better answer for that. So. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. We've been doing a lot of talking about these charts, and I think we need to use them. Okay. Now, I want to take a little bit of time and explain this example because there is a <coughs> lot going on with this example. Again, this may seem like one example problem, but in reality, it's four beam designs. Okay? So, what we're going to be doing is selecting the lightest W shape to resist a dead load of 600 pounds per foot. And for the ease of this problem, we're going to assume that that includes the self-weight of the beam. These beams for this problem end up being fairly light anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, and it's going to uh, withstand a concentrated service line load of 40 kips at mid-span. Okay? So I want to be absolutely clear as to what the problem looks like. Okay? So it's a 20-foot long beam and it's simply supported. Here's the beam. It's subjected to it's 
this this dead load is 600 pounds per foot and we have a load at mid span where that is 40 kips. Okay. Now, first off, we are also we, we are going to impose a deflection limit, a live load deflection limit of L over 300. We're actually going to handle that first. Each of the four beam designs that we do are all going to have to meet that deflection limit. We're going to find that it's not going to be the biggest deal in the world um, for, for most of these beams, but I am going to pose that limit to make sure you're thinking about it in the back of your head. All right. Now, like I said, we are going to do this problem four times, four different beam designs. Okay, And we're doing it four different times so that you all feel real comfortable with this process. Okay, So we're going to do it twice assuming LB is 20 and twice assuming LB is 10. So LB of 20 would be assuming that there's braces here and here. Okay. LB is 10 would be braces at the end and at mid-span. Bless you. The difference between the intermediate cases is the, uh, the odd cases, we're going to take C sub B to equal 1. The even cases, we're going to compute C sub B. And so we're going to see what happens as we, uh, as we extend this across the spectrum. Bless you. Now, I'm curious, before we do any math of these four designs, and I want to be absolutely clear, there are four different problems. Of these four designs, which one do you predict is going to be the heaviest beam? Bless you. Say again. Case one. That's exactly right. Case one is the case that has the longest unbraced length, so it's the worst case scenario on unbraced length, and we're taking C sub B one, which is the worst case scenario. So likewise, which do you think is going to be the lightest design? Case four. There we go. That's exactly right. Bless you. It's a pollen season. I, I totally understand. Um, I, I'm basically an allergy pill in, in every morning around this time frame. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and just start diving into it. get at least case one done today, maybe case two. We'll see. <coughs> All right. Now, before we do anything with any of these cases, we're going to impose our live load deflection limit right now. We're going to check that. So we have a beam. that is being subjected to a load at mid-span of, what is it, 40 kips. The beam is 20 foot long, and so this is 10 feet, this is 10 feet. Somebody tell me what is the live load, the, the, the maximum deflection, like what's the deflection that we get in this beam? First off, if you have a simply supported beam with a concentrated load at mid-span, where is the highest deflection on that beam? Mid-span. And what is the, that deflection? We can virtual work that thing if we want. We can start, you know, MM over EI, integrating that, or we can use table 322. What is the maximum deflection? Nope. Remember, 5WL to the 4th over 384EI only works if you have a simply supported beam and a uniformly distributed load. Everywhere else, that formula is trash. If you have a simply supported beam with a point load, PL, Q, 
cubed over 48 EI. And if we're in design mode, what don't we know? I. This is table 3-22. So, what is our maximum deflection for this problem? 0 0.8 inches. 0 0.8 inches. And how'd you get that? L over 300. L over 300. Okay. You are right, it ends up being uh, 0.8 inches, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that a little differently. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set delta max equal to delta log loads. So 300 equal P L cubed over 48 EI. And I'm going to solve for I. So flip and multiply. So... IX is 300 over L, PL cubed over 48E. Yes? I'm going to work the BBC to test this all the functions in front of I am okay with that. I'm not a mathematician, I'm an engineer. As long as you document it and you get the right answer, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get along with it. So that's going to be 300 P L squared over 48 E. Just cancel out the L's. I'm sure we could reduce that fraction a little bit, but I really don't care. Now, we can start throwing out a 1728 conversion factor, but instead I'm just going to ensure that everything's in consistent units. So 300, 40 kips. We have... 240 inches to the third, or sorry, to squared. We have 48, 29,000 KSI. And so what does that turn out to be? Four ninety six point six. I got twenty four point eight. Did you square that? Or three hundred times forty? Okay, hold on. I think you're I think you're getting overruled this time. Four ninety six point six. Well, here's what I'm going to do, all right? Here's how we're going to handle this. Okay, all right. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to basically impose a hard and fast rule that whatever section that we pick, it must have an IX greater than or equal to 497. I don't care. And this is going to be true for all four cases. All four cases. All right. Now, here's our beam. Let's look at case one. Case one, we're taking our C sub B value equal to one, and we're taking LB to be 20. Okay? So, we're going into the chart with an LB of 20, but an MU of what? We don't know yet because we haven't computed that yet. So let's take a look at our beam. Can we compute the MU with just these loads? <coughs> we could, but probably what we need to do is factor that load and factor that load. Would that be a fair statement? we got to factor it. So let's look at case one. What is W sub U? 1.2 W sub D, 1.2, 600 pounds per foot, which is what? Huh? 720 
pounds per foot. But let's get everything into kits. And PU is 1.6 PL, 1.6 times 40 kits. 1.6, that's about 56? 64. Sorry. Why we have calculators. Alright. Now, for this beam, where's the maximum bending moment going to be? Dead center, right? And what is the bending moment going to be? Well, I propose that the center line moment is going to be the center line moment due to the distributed load plus the center line moment due to the point load. What is the bending moment at mid span for a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load? WL squared over 8. Boom! WL squared over 8. What is the simply or the, the bending moment in a simply supported beam due to a concentrated load at mid span? PL over 4. The answer is not to take this load and divide it by 20 to get a kips per foot and say WL squared over 8. That is not the answer. And if you do that, shame on you. PL over 4. So the bending moment is W. L squared over 8 plus PUL over 4. What do we got for this? Why is that 40? Why is that 40? Nope, I did that wrong. This is why I had you all checking the back. 356? Right. 356. 356. <coughs> While we're at it, even though it's not going to be a big deal, let's have a pop quiz on structural analysis. Where is the maximum shear going to be on this beam? The reactions. Now the shear at the reactions is going to be the shear from the distributed load plus the shear from the point load. What is the shear here from a point or from a distributed load? WL over 2. WL over 2. What is the shear from a point load? P over, two. P over 2. Do not take that point load and divide it by 20 to get a distributed load. I will again ask you to stick your hand out so I can do that. W L over 2 plus P over 2. What do we get? 39.2 kits. 39.2 kits. We have a second on that. So right now, we have three requirements for this beam. It's BMN has to be greater than or equal to 356. It's VBN has to be greater than or equal to 39.2. And its IX has to be greater than or equal to 497. Moment shear deflection. The big three for a beam design. Okay. So let's take care of case one deflection. Case one, what's our C sub B value? One. one. So because C sub B equals one for case two, or for case one, 
So MU over C sub B is 356. And LB is what? For case one. 20. 20. Use them charts that we just found. And pick me a shape.
Remember, that's your expression. If you're in zone two. Is there, I mean, am I, am I going too fast? Is everybody with me on this? All right. We're running out of time, so we're going to call it. Don't worry. We're going to spend a lot of time with this example. This example is going to take at least all of next time, probably into, maybe into a little bit of Monday. So.